Okay, now uh, we want to finish up this discussion of particle orbits by going into a little bit different subject, uh, but then you'll see we'll come back to it. And what I want to talk about is the standard harmonic oscillator problem, and, and in particular uh, action angle, uh, uh, action variables and, and so forth. So let's talk about, uh, let's call it the harmonic oscillator problem. And there, what we have in mind is that just like we did with gyro motion, we take good old F equals MA, the force being the Lorentz force in that case, and we converted this into a simple, ordinary harmonic oscillator equation that X double dot plus omega squared X is equal to zero. And so this is an equation for any oscillatory motion, it turns out. And pragmatically, we can have this be gyro motion. We can have this be the bounce motion equation, although it's a little more complicated there, but basically to lowest order this is what it is. Or that drift motion. They're all, okay, cyclic or periodic motion. So this is a paradigm problem for that. Now, what we want to do is play with this and talk about this problem a bit because we're going to talk about it first regularly. Then what we're going to do is imagine that this gyro frequency or this frequency varies in time. As you remember, if I'm moving along the magnetic field, okay, I'm doing this gyration, the magnetic field strength is varying as I move along. So if that omega, capital omega, was equal to the cyclotron frequency, that cyclotron frequency would be changing as I move along the field line. So what we'd like to do first is, well, let's don't worry about that first. Let's worry about if this was constant, and then we'll talk about some of the things that happen if it's not constant. So the first thing we often do with this equation for seeing generally how these things proceed is we multiply it by dx dt. Uh, and then we have x double dot times x dot, which we can then write as d by dt of x dot squared over 2. So that's that term came down to there. And the next term will be x, x dot, uh, but that we can write as plus omega squared uh, d by dt of x squared over 2. And this is all then equal to 0. So that's just this term. Uh, dx dt, of course, is x dot. Well, if I just you know, put this all inside and add a mass, then this becomes just all this equation tells me is that energy is conserved. Namely, I have energy is equal to, I'll add a mass as an extra factor, mx dot squared over 2 uh, plus m omega squared x squared over 2. And that is equal to, I just added a constant here, or I just added the factor of a mass, of course. Uh, that's equal to a constant. Now, um, what I've, uh, let's see, the, another descriptor of this problem is that I've ended up using a force which is minus x hat dv dx, or minus grad v in the x direction, and that that force for this problem x double dot is, of course, the acceleration. So the omega squared x is actually the force and its derivative. And so that would turn out to be just minus um, omega squared x m in the x direction. But I can integrate that and say that the potential that this problem, implicit in this problem, is then that v is equal to gyro freak or frequency squared, uh, which will be the, our gyro frequency, x squared times the mass. So it's proportional to x squared. So for the simple harmonic oscillator problem, we effectively have a potential v of x as a function of x, which is just a parabolic well. Okay? So here's my parabolic well. And what happens to a, a particle that I put over here? And he falls down, and he goes over to the other side, and he oscillates back and forth, right? 
And so that's all this, this uh, uh, equation describes is a particle moving back and forth in a well. Or alternatively, we can look upon this as the good old standard pendulum problem. Okay, here's the pendulum and it's, you know, going back and forth. Okay. Now, what we want to do, though, is treat this in terms of action angle variables. and act, I'm sorry, action integral and action angle variables. And to do that, it's convenient to write the energy as the momentum, Px squared over 2 mass, and then plus the potential, plus V of x, where my V of x is just this x squared uh, potential here. Okay? Now, if we solve this equation then for the momentum, what we have is that P of x, or P sub x, sorry, is the square root of 2 times the mass times the energy minus the potential V of x. Okay. So that's just the momentum, you know, as I oscillate back and forth, either in this potential well or thinking about my standard gravitational pendulum problem. Uh, we perhaps should have put a little 7 up here to keep track of things. Okay, so what I want to do now is talk about these action uh, um, integral quantities. And the basic idea uh, of an action integral is that it is defined as an integral, a loop integral of P dQ, where as usual, P is equal to a momentum component in some particular direction, and Q is equal to a position coordinate. And the idea is that this quantity, the action, is supposed to be a more or less constant quantity, a, a, you know, sort of a constant, a roughly constant quantity. So let's uh, talk about uh, what it uh, sort of looks like. So for our gyro motion problem, okay, what we had was x double dot plus omega c squared, but I'm using capital omega for the moment. Uh, times x is equal to 0. And so I've used all the right variables here. And the x is just, in that problem, is the distance as I go gyrating around the field line. It's my distance off the field line, you know, in the x or y direction. So we'll just use the x direction. So what, for the action, which I, by the way, I'm going to get the magnetic moment out of this in a while. But anyway, so what I'm into then is that... Uh, this becomes the integral of Px dx okay? for my gyro motion problem or the harmonic oscillator problem I've been talking about or whatever we want to do. And now we had worked out what that momentum looked like. And so we can just do this as a loop integral just means, you know, to integrate over the whole period, basically. So it's integral dx square root of 2 times uh, mass times... I need to extend this, e minus v of x, but we had that our v of x was omega squared x squared over 2 times mass, so we'll just put that in. Um, so that's m omega squared over 2 times x squared. So we'd like to perform that integral. How do we perform that integral? Um, well, it turns out it's convenient to normalize this by taking 2 mass Energy is a constant of the motion, so we can take that out. And then we have the loop integral dx of the square root of 1 minus m omega squared over 2 energy, all times x squared. So this is convenient then to define a new variable, y is equal to x times the square root of m omega squared divided by 2e. And... Then uh, this, okay, sticking that in, we then have root 2 mass energy and then root 2e over m omega squared. And then we have a loop integral dy square root of 1 minus y squared. <coughs> um, 
Okay, some things, the mass uh, kind of cancels out of this. Um, and uh, the 2 will come out, we'll get 2e over m, so we can see we're going to get 2e over omega. How do I calculate this loop integral? Well, all you do is you say y is equal to cosine of theta, and you know, by angles, what it turns out this is, is 4 times the integral from 0 to pi by 4 then, pi by 2, sorry, of d theta, and dy, sorry, is, uh, I'm sorry, I wanted to make this sine theta, and then this becomes cosine theta, d theta. So it's d theta, cosine theta, and then the square root of 1 minus y squared will also be cosine theta. This is cosine squared theta, and it turns out if you then perform this integral, you just get pi by 4. And um, so lo and behold, that 4 cancels that one, and all we end up with is an extra factor of pi. So this is 2 pi energy over frequency. And so any action integral turns out to be energy per unit frequency. Okay, so this is kinetic energy per unit oscillation frequency. So frequency of oscillation. Now, let's briefly apply this to our magnetic moment problem. Okay, so this is our gyro motion problem. What is the relevant energy for that problem? Well, it's only the perpendicular energy, so it's mv perp squared over 2, because we're just gyrating around the field line. The parallel part's not incidental to that. And what's the relevant gyro frequency, omega? Well, it's omega sub c, which is q b naught over m, right? So therefore, my action which is 2 pi e over omega, just becomes 2 pi, and the energy, okay, I can write as mv perp squared over 2, and then uh, my frequency becomes qb over m, and so we can, you know, cancel out a few things here, uh, like the 2, uh, the mass goes together, and so we get a mass times pi, and then mv perp squared over 2b. And that's what we called our magnetic moment. So in other words, that quantity which we previously identified, you remember, was if you take a particle uh, as the magnetic moment, and we did so on the basis that we had a field line here, and as we had a particle around, gyrating around it, it, the current carried by that produced a certain magnetic moment, mu vector, which was downward. And what we're effectively finding is that the action integral corresponding to this periodic motion around the field line is in fact this magnetic moment, and so the adia, it's, it, it will turn out to be an adiabatic invariant in a moment. Uh, but, but anyway, so the action integral appropriate to gyro motion, or the, what's called the first uh, invariant, uh, is, uh, is, it turns out, uh, just the magnetic moment. Now, um, it's rather complicated nonlinear dynamics to go through this in detail, but I want to describe phenomenologically what happens if we go back to our harmonic oscillator problem and say that the frequency omega is varying in time. What does that mean, by the way? Well, physically it means, imagine I had a bowl here, okay? It means maybe the bowl, sides of the bowl are changing in size, okay? <laughs> or alternatively, if I think of my pendulum problem, it's the same mathematically then maybe I'm taking the string and lengthening or shortening it, and that will change my period of oscillation, right? Now, what if I just, you know, 
think of the pendulum if I just shorten the string continuously with time. Well, you know, the, the period will just go, <laughs> it'll just keep getting faster and faster until it goes to infinity or something or other, you know. But what we really are worried about, you remember, is that we have this situation that we have fastest was gyro motion, sort of 300 times slower was this bounce motion, and another couple, a few hundred times slower than that was this drift motion. So it's as if this pendulum length here, okay, is being lengthened and shortened slowly compared to the rate at which I'm, you know, oscillating back and forth. So that's the kind of types of, of variation that one uh, wishes to imagine. Let me just say it that way. So let's uh, seven, eight, uh, nine. So what I want to do is then ask the question: Suppose omega <coughs> is equal to. Uh, some oscillatory function of time. What would happen to our action integral? Um, you know, again, this is like varying the length of the pendulum or something like that. Well, we end up defining a, a parameter epsilon. Epsilon is always a small parameter. Everybody knows that from mathematics. Um, anyway, so this is 1 over omega squared d omega dt. And you can also write this as 1 over omega d by dt of the logarithm of omega. And that's of order some frequency with which we're lengthening or changing, or the, 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 which we're changing this rate of oscillation over gyro frequency, or over frequency. So what we're going to have in mind is this is the bounce frequency over the gyro frequency. So we're oscillating this way. And then more slowly, we're bouncing back and forth. Then it turns out I is equal to energy per unit frequency is still approximately constant. But if you go through the formal mathematics, what you find is that there's some I naught, which is the thing we actually calculated already. So this is the integral PDQ, our action integral. Plus, it turns out there's an epsilon, I1 tilde, and an, an epsilon squared, I2 tilde, plus, and so forth. So these are a bunch of corrections to the action integral, which are small in the sense that this parameter epsilon is small. By the way, we had about a hundredth here, remember. So that's a pretty small quantity. A hundredth, and it's oscillatory. That's, that, that means oscillatory. So this means that, you know, this action integral is what we regularly calculate plus some small oscillatory corrections. If that's all we had to worry about, life would be great. The problem is there's a so-called secular part. And that secular part, which it takes some doing to do, delta i over i turns out to be some function of 1 over epsilon times e to the minus um, uh, 1 over epsilon. Or you can make it it's some function of the frequency of the oscillator divided by its, its frequency uh, or its rate of change times e to the minus um, cyclotron frequency over, um, or I'm sorry, uh, oscillation frequency over frequency. here. So the idea then, uh, oh, and this form turns out to be something like often 1 over epsilon, maybe to the 3 halves power. This is a very funny, by the way, it's a, it's a as, as far as analytic functions go, it's a essential singularity, right? If I tried to expand this in a power series, you know, I get 1 minus 1 over epsilon plus 1 over epsilon squared, blah, blah, blah. In the limit of small epsilon, that's a pretty bad function. It's an essential singularity in the limit that epsilon goes to 0. It's e to the minus infinity then, right? Well, it turns out in order to keep this term small, I mean, the, the object of the game here is we calculated this PDQ and we'd like to claim that's all I need to care about. Don't need all the rest of this stuff, okay? In order for that to be the case, 
what you turn out to have to have is that this epsilon, which is the rate of change of the frequency, maybe I'll write it here as 1 over omega uh, d by dt log omega, we need this to be typically smaller than about a tenth. If that condition holds, then it turns out that the secular part and all these oscillatory parts are small. So the net result of all that is then that if our, indeed our frequencies are very disparate, you know, our gyro frequency is much faster than our bounce frequency is much faster than our drift frequency, then the, adio, the action integrals that go with those particular quantities are more or less constant. So let's, uh, let's, do, uh, let's summarize how that stuff kind of goes. Um, so um, action integrals. in small gyro radius limit. So we're going to have a little sort of table here. And the first adiabatic invariant, the motion we're interested in, is the gyro motion. What is the frequency of that motion? Well, it's this gyro frequency or cyclotron frequency, omega c, is qb naught over m. And what's the action variable that we have there? Well, pdq turned out to be this magnetic moment, mv perp squared over 2b. What do we require for the validity of this? Well, we require that however fast the cyclotron frequency varies, as I move along the magnetic field where B changes, is small. So what I require is that the bounce frequency divided by the cyclotron frequency be small compared to 1. A subsidiary condition is if the magnetic field is varying in time, I need omega over omega C is much less than 1. What happens if I violate those? Magnetic moment's not constant. Okay? This is called, should have said, magnetic moment. So if I want to heat particles, I want to increase their V perp, irrespective of what's do, happening with B, I've got to break one of these two constants of the motion. So I heat with frequencies of the order of cyclotron frequency in order to heat, it turns out. We'll come back to that. I need to break that constancy. What's my second motion? Well, my second motion is the bounce motion. Um, my bounce frequency was of the order of V parallel over L parallel. The action associated with this in plasma physics is usually called J, and plus or minus the mass, it turns out, and that's M dV parallel dL parallel. And what's the condition for validity of this. Well, it's that the next slower frequency, the curvature drifts, B cross grad, B drifts, etc., compared to the bounce frequency are much less than one. And again, as a subsidiary, that the magnetic fields and electric fields and so forth and so on also are not varying too rapidly. So then what about my third adiabatic invariant? And that's for our drift motion. And there we have that the, curve, the drift is this drift velocity divided by the radius. Now, the action there is a little bit complicated because you remember what we were doing was drifting around in an angle. And it turns out the action variable is the magnetic flux that's enclosed by that, um, which is usually written as psi d theta for a magnetic field, which is given in what's called the Klepsch representation of uh, grad psi cross grad theta. I don't, it's, it's just the magnetic flux enclosed by the drift. And what is the condition for validity of that? Well, it's again going to be that the frequency, com frequency of change relative to the frequency of this periodic motion has to be small compared to one. 
um, if I violate this inequality, frequency of the <coughs> being small compared to the cyclotron frequency, I would do cyclotron heating. If I violate this inequality, I would do what's called bounce or magnetic pumping, you know, because I'm pumping particles back and forth. And if I violate this one, I would do something that some people call drift pumping. Okay, I pump on the same time scale as the drifts, thereby violating this um, uh, flux invariant, thereby moving particles across flux surfaces, uh, encompassing more and more magnetic flux. So these are the action integrals that are relevant uh, to plasma physics. And depending upon what frequency of oscillation we're interested in, we may be interested in one or more uh, of these. Okay. Next time, uh, or to finish off, if people haven't read it yet, they should read the last of Chen's chapter 2 and also Bittencourt's chapter uh, 2, 3, and 4. And then for next time, we're going to start into, we're going to finish off a little bit of finite alarm radius effect drifts just at the first of last next time. But then we're going to start into how we describe plasmas as a fluid. And for doing that, what we will do is we need, you need to start reading on Chen chapter 3 and uh, Bittencourt chapters uh, 6, 7, and 8, actually. 6, 7, 8, and 9. You can read 5 now or later, it turns out.